So science is undergoing profound changes today, and it is due to the explosion of data. We have already seen in Curtis's talk how all this data is changing the way we can look at, uh, we can study the universe. And it's amazing to think about, so think about it. Every year we collect more data than from the rest of the data from the beginning of mankind. So every year we have to go through twice as much data to basically understand what we are <clears throat> what we are seeing. And where does this data explosion come from? So we are building larger and larger telescopes. The green curve shows the amount of telescope glass area over the last 30 years. The last little upturn is just about a billion dollars. But really, the explosion comes from Moore's law, from the little solid state devices, the CCD detectors, which are in every CCD camera, every, every camera that we buy today. And they have grown by a factor of 3,000, and it keeps growing. So basically, Gordon Moore is responsible for this explosion of data. <laughs> and what is amazing also that it's not just about CPUs, so it changes the scientific computing. And before, we built faster and faster computers, but we now also have to build computers which can read this data faster and faster. And this is leading to a new kind of science called e-science. And science is evolving. And for thousands of years, science was very empirical. So we were just describing nature. We were, Leonardo created these beautiful drawings. The Chinese created the star charts. Then over the last few hundred years, we tried to capture nature in the terms of equations, starting with Kepler's laws and general relativity and quantum electrodynamics. And over the last 10 years, or tens of years, starting with the Manhattan Project, Computers became an essential part of science. We were trying to use these computers to solve the equations the, that we were able to write down, but did not have an analytic solution. And what we see over the last few years emerging is the science is driven increasingly by data, Com coming from astronomy to particle physics to genomics, everywhere you look. And this requires a new way of thinking about these things. So the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is a very good example of this. It was one of the first big projects in astronomy that in many ways resembled the Human Genome Project. So sometimes we call it the Cosmic Genome Project, which took several trillions of pixels of imaging from the sky, and it also at the same time got distances to the nearest one million galaxy. So we created also a three-dimensional map of the universe. And we built an access to all this data, to many terabytes of data. And the primary goal when we designed the system was to share, the f so create fun. And first, the astronomy community kind of encountered this. They looked at it with suspicion. So if something is so much fun, it cannot be right at the same time. <laughs> but today, this is the world's most used astronomy facility. But the most important aspect of this is that when we looked at the user logs, we were stunned. So there are only about 10 to 15,000 professional astronomers in the world. And what we saw is that we had about a million distinct users. So we saw the emergence of the internet scientists. So why are these people doing it? Why are they looking at Sloan data? They don't want to write papers. They don't get a career advancement out of it. They are simply having fun looking at data that possibly no human eye has looked at ever before. So a few years ago, we took some images from the Sloan and created the Galaxy Zoo website, so I was part of this team. And we asked people to visually classify the galaxies to determine whether a galaxy is a spiral or an elliptical. We expected a few thousand people. In the first three days, we got 300,000 people signing up. And our computers literally melted down, so we blew fuses in the computer room. It was amazing, and people wrote poems and blogs about it. It was just beyond any expectation. And then an amazing thing happened. So on one of the images, a Dutch school teacher saw a little blurry spot next to a galaxy, and she wrote a blog about it that I don't think this is actually real. I think that this is really... So, sorry, I don't think this is a telescope error. This, I think that this is something real. And indeed, this object was found on a bigger telescope, and it's the light reflected from a quasar, which has since gone extinct. And it's made into pop culture. Two days ago, this was even on the David Letterman show. <laughs> so, how long does this continue? 
So one can think about how many generations of instruments do we have, how many CCD mosaics can be put on the existing telescopes before we reach the limits, how many new telescopes can be built. At the same time, there is a new kind of instrument emerging, which is the computer. So we are running bigger and bigger simulations of the universe or of other physical phenomena, and the simulations are starting to reach petabytes. But today, we have real problems with this. So, because the computers cannot handle all this data very well, so while we are running the simulations, we have to do the analysis there and then. So, essentially, only those people who are running the simulation can analyze it, then afterwards we just throw away the data. At the same time, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to place these huge simulations and place them next to the observations and compare the two, and for example, to be able to walk in the simulated universes with billions of galaxies and kind of touch some of those. So this is starting to happen. So this shows a couple of, a couple of visualizations of a simulation consisting of a billion particles that tries to build a Milky Way galaxy that resembles the Milky Way in many ways. The next one is my personal favorite. This is a real-time simulation of 100 million particle simulations, but they said this was done in real time, and it was done by a Caltech undergraduate as part of a summer project. He happens to be my son, Tomas. I'm really <laughs> proud. <laughs> And the last simulation, this is, sorry, this is not simulation, this is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, a rendering of the density, the different regions with different densities, and you can see how wonderful this texture is, how beautiful this is, and how much fun it is. And wouldn't it be wonderful to really to go and touch and each of these and tag them and learn more about them. <clears throat> Feynman called turbulence the last unsolved problem of classical physics. And with my colleagues at Hopkins, we took a 30 terabyte simulation, which is very large with today's standards, and we created almost something which is almost like a computer game out of it. So we are able to take our laptops and shoot little particles into the simulations, like in a game. And these are like sensors in the movie Twister that the people put into the tornadoes. So we use our laptops to place these sensors into the, into the simulation and they report back the status of the fluid. So this is a new paradigm of analyzing very large simulations because if this sensors report back fast enough, we don't care whether it's 30 terabytes or a petabyte, and I can place the sensors wherever there is something interesting that I would like to see. So in summary, science is increasingly driven by very large data sets today. But what we have to deal with is not just a computing problem. This is really, when we want to tackle these problems, we need a new instrument. We need something like a scanning electron microscope of data. But at the same time, we also want to see the big picture. So we want to have something which is a telescope of data. So we need something like a data scope. And this data deluge, this data explosion, is not specific to astronomy. It's happening on every scale of the physical world. It's happening in particle physics. Think of the human genome projects or all the uh, weather simulations for the ocean circulations. And it is changing so the sociology of science. But more, and more than anything, it is fun. So it is fun, it's play. At the same time, it is also excellent science. And I would like to finish on a personal note. So 38 years ago, I was an undergraduate, a physics major in Hungary. And I was just finishing my undergrad studies, and there was a big international conference on neutrino physics, and Richard Feynman was one of the speakers. So as the youngest person on the Hungarian team, I was in charge of setting up the sound system at the conference. So I was doing that, placing the microphones, and in walks Feynman. Binks at me, grabs the microphone, and starts imitations of the afternoon speakers. <laughs> then afterwards, the week following the conference, I had the privilege to be the uh, guide to the Feynman, so I traveled with them all over the country, and I had lots of conversations. And it was really amazing to talk to him. And he, once he spotted the final lectures on my bookshelf, he actually took it off and gave this wonderful dedication. And I still very fondly remember those days.
So when he was irreverent with his colleagues and he couldn't be nicest to a young kid at the beginning of his career. Thank you very much.